we'll get into it. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered, when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Let me pray. Lord, as we come to your word, by your spirit I pray you would open our ears to hear this very word. You have in your sovereign plan given this passage of your holy scripture for us to study and to hear from this evening. And Lord God, I ask that you would simply speak your word by your spirit. It would not be mine, but it would be your words that are spoken. That your people would be blessed. And Lord, that sinners would be saved. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, this past week I happened to hear a familiar song, which you may well know. It's from the late 60s. It's called Spirit in the Sky. It's well used in films and TV shows. And what was notable to me as I heard it, and I've heard it many times before, was that it speaks of Jesus. And it uses language that speaks of him as a mate, as a pal, as a buddy. And it says, the the author of the the song, the, the one who wrote it, says, he will recommend me to the Spirit in the sky. He will set me up with the Spirit in the sky. Is that true? Is that the real Jesus? Is that what he does for his people? Well, the obvious answer is no. The song is not written from a Christian perspective. In fact, the Christian references in it are merely he used them to write a song. He's not a believer. He wasn't when he wrote it. And as far as I know, he's not right now. But I say it because a lot of people, and I think we can be tempted to think of Jesus like that, as just a pal, someone who can recommend you to God. Well, the truth is so much better than that. That is complete and utter rubbish in that song. Do not get your theology from it. Get it from the Word of God that is completely true. So this text is all about Jesus, the real Jesus, the true Jesus, and it's so much better than that stupid song. You'll remember the context. Hebrews is written 
to churches, uh, or it could be a church, could be a number of churches, from a Jewish background who are tempted to withdraw from Jesus and go back into Judaism for safety. The answer to that temptation is Jesus himself. Simply, what is the theme of this letter? It's from the start to the end. It is the supremacy of Jesus. There is no one better than him. That's the message. And so to our text this evening. There's two parts, verses 5 to 9, and then verses 10 to 18. Look with me, beginning at verse 5. This section 5 to 9 shows us this shows us that Jesus, his lordship, is universal. It is all about the universal lordship of Jesus. Look in verse 5. The connection here is to verse 14, that trail of argument that the writer has already been going through by showing Jesus is greater than angels. And so he goes back to that point here. For it was not to angels, created beings as they are, that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking, he says. He begins by saying, the rule of Christ over the world to come. This is speaking of the fullness of the kingdom of God come. The new heaven and the new earth. It is not subject to angels. They do not rule over it. It is subject to Jesus. And then he continues in verses 6 through 8, and he cites Psalm 8, a really fascinating and wonderful psalm, which is an ode to the majesty of God. But more than that, it also speaks hugely of the frailty and dignity of human beings. The dignity part in particular, it's referencing back to Genesis 1, when human beings were given to put the earth uh, under their subjection, to be subdue it, they were told, to rule over it under God. Now, of course, that is, has been frustrated by sin, and yet the psalmist still is in wonder that God would give such a wonderful privilege to human beings. Our author here shows that these very verses that he cites from Psalm 8 are fulfilled in Jesus. That which was lost and broken by sin has now come to full fruition in the perfect man, Jesus Christ. So have a look with me. He quotes a number of verses, but you'll see in the exposition, his explanation of how they apply to Christ, which is in 8 and 9, that he focuses particularly on what we have here, verse 7 and 8. You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Originally speaking of human beings merely, but fulfilled in Jesus. How? What is through the cross? And what is his rule and reign? Where is he now? Is a question that maybe is help us understand this. Where is Jesus? Well, If we know our Bibles, even if we know the first few verses of this very book in chapter 1, we will know that he is enthroned at the right hand of God Almighty. He is exalted. He's gone through the cross, the humiliation of the incarnation, the suffering of death for his people, and he has risen and he has ascended to the right hand of the Father. And there he sits enthroned. So fundamentally important that we understand that for what is said here. Because the rule and reign of Christ, he is ruling from the right hand of the Father, enthroned on high, is how he has fulfilled that rule that humanity frustrated. Look in his explanation, verse 8. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, that is Christ, he left nothing outside of his control. It's universal. His rule and reign over the world to come, his rule and reign at the right hand of God is full and complete. The double negative is just emphasizing the fact nothing is left outside of his control, meaning all things are under his control. Such is his amazing universal lordship. But then he continues, or I should say just slightly before, uh, after I, forgive me, At present, second half of verse 8, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. That sounds like a negative, doesn't it? You notice the comma in our English translations is because that's not the end of this sentence. Next part helps us understand it. But it should be said 
that when we look around the world today, what do we see? We see sin. We see death. And they're continuing. They're present here. They're not yet in that sense under the, the rule and reign of Christ. They will be. And the certainty of the fact that they will be is shown because he is enthroned. They are under the judgment of God, sin and death and all of the wicked who practice it currently. That hangs over them. Why? Because Jesus is presently enthroned. That fullness of his rule and reign is coming. It's not in doubt. He's not gone to the throne and come off it. He is still and presently enthroned through his cross work. That is, his life, his death, his resurrection for his people. And he explains that very thing. He continues, verse 9, But we see him, and now the fulfillment of those citations from Psalm 8, who for a little while was made lower than the angels. The little while part has been brought to the beginning of the sentence to emphasize the temporary nature of his humiliation. A little while refers here to his earthly ministry that was completed when he was risen from the dead. His mission accomplished. For a little while, temporary was his humiliation. Permanent is his exaltation. And that's the very point here. For a little while was made lower than the angels. In case we doubt, verse 9, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor, the exaltation part. Jesus has been crowned with glory and honor. He has received the crown. This is this special honor for someone who has won a victory. It's his victory of the cross. His victory to come and save his people to defeat death for them. He is presently seated, crowned with glory and honor. Because of what? Because of the suffering of death. Because of his cross. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Here, everyone refers to each one of God's people. Every single man, woman, young person, and child who through all the ages until he returns will trust in him. That's clear from verse 10, which refers to the many sons brought to glory. That's the same reference. Every single one of those sons will be brought to glory through Jesus Christ. No, not a single one will be lost. So we see here the universal lordship of Jesus, the Son. Verses 10 to 18 then. Here we see Jesus' solidarity with his human family. This week I've gone back and forth as to whether I should use the word solidarity because it's not something that I even use in day-to-day -day life. But you, see the, you get the point, hopefully. It means he associates with us. He identifies with us. The us is his human family. Family. He is God, God the Son, that God the Son would love us, would identify with us. What a remarkable thing. And that's what our author turns to now. Verse 10, For it was fitting that he, speaking of Christ, for, uh, for whom and by whom all things exist, he, he first is God, I should say, God the Father, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. The founder here refers to a leader, a hero, a champion who saves, but not only saves, he does it by leading his people into glory. What a description of the Lord Jesus. He is the leader, the champion, the hero of our salvation. And it says here that he's been made perfect through suffering. So he's not saying he wasn't sinless before. He certainly was. Perfect here through suffering is referring to the fact that he has fulfilled and accomplished what God the Father had given him to do. That is, to become the high priest of his people. To become their saviour. To have risen from the dead and made them his people forever. He's done it. He's accomplished it. It's achieved. And thus he has been made perfect, but it was achieved through suffering. Think here of the violent death of Christ. It's hard to contemplate in all its fullness if we stop for a second and actually do it. If we read in the Gospels what Christ suffered, it's an awful thing that any human being suffered it, made in God's image. But that God, 
would go through that? What a great salvation that God would suffer such a violent death, innocent, sinless, for me and for you, brother and sister in Christ. He's done it. It's achieved. He's been made perfect through suffering. He's accomplished all that he was given to do by the Father. Verse 11, and again, stressing the solidarity. All of this part is stressing the fact that Jesus is with us, identifies with us, and is for us. And there are precious metaphors here of describing us as God's people. And it's all because of the work of God in Christ. So let's look at them. For he who sanctifies, we're told in verse 11, that is Jesus, and those who are sanctified, all of God's people, all have one source. That is, we have been by the blood of Christ made holy by Jesus. And thus, we are in God, in Christ. You get the enormity of that. We have one source with Christ, that we are in him, we are thus in God. And so, here's the first of these precious metaphors. That is why, verse 11 says, he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Brothers. What an intimate term. A term of close relationship. A term of family. We could say here that this is brothers or sisters. Close relation. Family. God in Christ calls every believer brother and sister. It's a wonderful thing to have human brothers. It's a wonderful that we in Christ get to call one another brother and sister. But we only do so because he first has called us brother and sister. God has made us his family in Jesus. Jesus has done this. What intimate relationship we have with God in Christ. He's not ashamed to call them brothers. And then here he quotes in verses 12 and 13, two passages. He cites Psalm 22, 22. Here in context is a psalm very much associated and fulfilled with the death and resurrection of Jesus, his suffering on the cross. But the second part that's quoted from here is the part where after crying out for deliverance, and that's what people remember about the, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But what so often people forget is that is not the end of the psalm. At 22, what is quoted here is the beginning of the thanks and the trust of the righteous sufferer in the God who has heard his cry. Jesus meant all of it when he said that on the cross. It was not a cry of lack of faith. It was exactly the opposite, a cry of trust in God who delivers and does deliver him. So here, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. Surely Jesus fulfilled this. In his preaching of the kingdom, he proclaimed the name of God. That is the saving power of God. But the stress here is on that close relationship. What does he say? I will tell of your name to my brothers. My brothers. How personal is this? How wonderfully personal is this? Christ calls us his brothers. And then in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. In the midst of the congregation, he took on flesh. He became a human in order to save humans. He has accomplished it. Praise God for his salvation in Jesus Christ. What a saviour we have. And then he cites twice from Isaiah 8. Isaiah 8, 17 and Isaiah 8, 18. First, in verse 13 of our passage, and again, I will put my trust in him. And the context here is the people of Israel are a rebellious generation. Judgment is looming. And the prophet Isaiah says that he will trust in God. It is an expression of his trust in God, even though the nation is has abandoned him. Here, of course, it expresses and finds fulfillment in the Lord Jesus' trust in the Father. Throughout his earthly ministry, he trusted in the Father and obeyed all that he was given. He spoke every word that the Father gave him, and he fulfilled the work that God the Father gave him to do. Second, if you have a look, it says, and this is from Isaiah 8, 18, 
Behold, I and the children God has given me. Isaiah says here, back in the day in which he wrote, that he and his children were to be signs for this rebellious generation. Signs of what it is to walk with God in faithfulness and trust and obedience. It wasn't just him, it was him and the children that God had given. So thus here it is applied to Christ. And it is thus that his people here, again, so tender, so personal, so emotional, the people of Christ are described by him as his children. The children that the Father has given to the Son. That is what we are as God's people, the very children of God. Verse 14, he continues, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, speaking of Christ, likewise partook of the same things. Jesus had to become a true human being in order to save human beings. But he was also still God. He is the God-man. But he had to take on a true humanity, yet without sin, to redeem people. He had to become a human, and so he did. That's what that's referring to. And it says that he did this in the incarnation, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. It's that great line, that he defeated death by death. Could it have been any other way? No. That God would himself die to defeat the power of death that hung over his people due to our sin. And here it's mentioned of the devil, the Satan, the enemy, the adversary, a spiritual being of evil who hates God and hates all people even made in his image and works all he can to tempt and entice them to sin. And so he works in the realm of death. When it says here that he has the power of death, it doesn't mean that he becomes God. No, there is only one sovereign over all things, and that is God eternal. But secondarily, he works this enemy in the realm of death to tempt and tease people, and put thus for them to sin, and sin which produces death. That is his realm. But that, for God's people, is broken. It's broken through Christ's death. He has defeated the power of death over all his children. And it speaks here in strong language, which you'll see. It's still in verse 14. That through Christ's death, that he might destroy the one who has the power of death. It speaks not only of his power broken, it also speaks of his ultimate destiny. Read Revelation chapter 20 and see that how fire, eternal conscious torment, is reserved for Satan, all the demons, and every single human being who re persists in rebelling against God and dies in that state. They will all face eternal conscious torment and everlasting destruction. And so that is reserved for this enemy, a defeated enemy, yes, because of Christ. But not only was it to destroy the power of Satan, verse 15 his death also delivers all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For us as Christians, death that we see today, think of the last two years, the decisions made politically, what has driven everything? The fear of death. The fear of death. This virus is brought into sharp relief. People's fear of dying. For us as Christians, that fear is gone. Not a little bit, not some of it. It is gone if we see the truth of who Jesus is. What has he done? He's completely removed the fear. We're not in slavery to that fear anymore because he alone has gone through death for us. Spurgeon puts it beautifully in contemplating the tomb on the Sunday morning. Consider it first the days before, after the Lord Jesus had died and his body was interred in the tomb, the stone rolled on. It was a place of darkness and death. Truly fearful. Not so Sunday morning. Stone was rolled away. The sun shining in. 
death for us because of Christ's work is no longer a place of fear and terror. It is just the doorway, the gateway to eternity. Praise God. Praise Jesus. We have been freed from that lifelong slavery to the fear of death. Verse 16, For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Abraham, the man of faith, the founder of the people of God in Israel, and truth, excuse me, truly the remnant, those who were themselves always the people of faith in God. It is for this people, human beings, who trust in God, who believe his promises and it is accredited to them as righteousness, as it was Abraham, finding all of its fulfillment, these promises, in Jesus. It is these that he helps. And to help them, see in 17, he had therefore to be made like his brothers in every respect. Should add here, this doesn't mean that he became sinful. It means that he became truly human yet without sin. For if he sinned, he could never have saved. He could never have been that sacrifice that was without spot or blemish. And he wouldn't be God. But he has come. He has become like us in every respect and yet without sin. How and what for? So that he might become a merciful, that is compassionate, not indifferent. We don't want to make Jesus, we would get him wrong to make him a sort of emotional wreck but we certainly get him wrong to make him an emotionless saviour. See here, he is a compassionate high priest. His compassion, his love for his people. But he's also a faithful high priest. He's achieved that which he was given. He's completed the saving purposes of God. And the high priest, you'll remember in the Old Testament, was to come before uh, God, representing the people, and offer sacrifice for his sins and for all of theirs. But the point being, he was to represent them, and it was in the context of sacrifice, so that they could be in relationship with God. That whole system and that high priest points to its fulfillment in the high priest, Jesus Christ, who is compassionate and faithful. His sacrifice it is alone that has forgiven our sins. And so we see here, in the service of God, it was all for him to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Propitiation is a big word, but it's a very crucial word for us to understand what Jesus has done in saving us. It means that Jesus has satisfied in himself the wrath and judgment of God against our sin, against us. He has satisfied it. When he talks of drinking the dregs of the cup of God's wrath, he drank every last drop and so satisfied the justice of God Almighty. But in so doing, he has thus cleansed us of our sins. Not some of them. Oh, dear brother and sister, as I've contemplated this this week, I think how many of us struggle with regret. If only I could just go back and change that, and not say that. How we struggle needlessly. Propitiation means they've all been dealt with. All of them. Yes, we should press on and hate sin more and more, and turn and turn from it, and walk in obedience, but we ought not to act or think that there is some of our sin not yet paid for. He has made propitiation. He has satisfied God's justice, and he has thoroughly and completely wiped away all of our sins. He's paid for them. All of them. Every single one. And lastly, verse 18, speaks here of the continuing solidarity he has with us, his human people. It's not merely that he's done this wonderful salvation for us and achieved it, and then he just lets us go, and we wander off. In unconcerned with us. No, his compassion and love for his people is constant and continues forever. Look in 18, for he him, because he himself has suffered when tempted, the Lord Jesus faced every temptation that he could, and yet without sin. So, he is able to help those who are being tempted. 
What a Savior. What a continuing high priest who loves us. And also, as the only one who has gone through temptation without sinning, thus he is here to help his people when we are tempted. He's the only one who can. And so what should we do with all of this? Well, my prayer this week and even today has been that this would not stay here. If all of these marvelous truths, all of this incredibly deep theology of who Jesus is stays here, what good does it do? Scratches an intellectual itch, but what good does it do? This truth has to get to here. It has to enter deeply. We have to, as it were, consume it in its fullness. It is the Spirit who helps us to do this, but we must never take this lightly. And I think as I have been reading this this week and praying, it certainly speaks to us that we should, in our worship, which doesn't mean just when we sing, by the way, it's all of our lives, our worship should be of Jesus. It should be reverent. Reverent. He's not just aching. He's the King of kings. He's enthroned at the right hand of God. He is the one we worship. When we declare his praise, we are declaring his goodness, his rightness, his glory. Praise God we should praise him reverently because of who he is. But that doesn't mean we should be dour and upset and not be able to be joyful. We should also praise God with celebration. The victory that's spoken here is one that should be celebrated. We celebrate birthdays. We celebrate achievements. Brother, sister, are you celebrating daily the victory of Jesus Christ? So I've been very challenged this week how I need to celebrate daily, how I need to remember his victory is done and is complete, and he is utterly supreme. We should celebrate when we worship the name of the Lord Jesus. And lastly, to take us back to the contents, remember, those to whom this was written were struggling. They felt temptation to withdraw from Jesus because of persecution to go back into Judaism where they would get social safety. What did they need? They needed to see Jesus. Do we need any less? No. We need just the same. This applies just as much to us as it did to them. And they are left with a great assurance in verse 18. And so are we. To be strengthened by this verse, to be clear that in the face of temptation, where do you go? You don't trust yourself. You don't trust your own efforts. You flee to Jesus because he alone is a compassionate, merciful, faithful high priest who has been through all temptation and yet without sin. He alone is the source of help when tempted. So, saints, I say to you, Whatever temptation to sin you may be experiencing, the answer is to run and cling to Jesus. What assurance of this high priest. What assurance in the face of temptation that he is for us eternally. Praise God. Let me pray for us. Actually, before I pray, let's turn to a time of prayer. This is a chance for us to express praise to God to call out to God in light of his word, to focus on Jesus. So let's do just that, and I'll close.